I'm Leslie Rickards. I'm introducing the next two talks, the first of which uh, is from David Pugh on the, the science behind the ocean tide. Whilst they're changing the equipment here, I could say that uh, I've worked with David for a long period of time. He interviewed me when I came for my job first at uh, iOS at Bidston. He's been involved with work on tides and sea level for many years and continues that with great enthusiasm in his retirement. So David, it's all yours. I should say, after 25 minutes, I'm going to drift. No, you're not, because he all around. <laughs> 25 minutes from now, he said he can break his own rules. Is that coming through? Yeah, Don't worry, I've got another set here. Now that, well, you'll have to make do with that interesting stuff which has just appeared on the screen. Um, yes, I interviewed Philip Woodworth as well, as it happens. <laughs> uh, two excellent choices. Um, Philip, thanks for the invitation. You're going, I'm going to embarrass you now. You showed three FRSs. What you didn't say is that this summer you're going to get an award from the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics for lifetime services to sea level studies. So I think that's uh, worth noting as well. I rather hope you do that. Um, Philip, thank you for the invitation. It makes a pleasant change from shopping in Chester on a Saturday morning. Although I have to point out that Chester was a port long before Liverpool and presumably a port which depended very much on the tidal access up the River Dee. So maybe in Chester we should organize a follow-up to this called Tides in the Port of Chester. May not get as many people. Um, you had the fire warnings. Uh, here's one more. I've given this talk or something similar a few times in many places. And after one of them, somebody came up to me and said, you know, it sounds as if, if it wasn't for the work done at the Liverpool Tidal Institute, there wouldn't be any tides. <laughs> Which means I hadn't given a very good talk, obviously. <laughs> it's not true, of course. Um, people have been observing the tides since people were on Earth. Um, The, observing the tides is a very tedious thing to do because you have to take the readings every five, every 15, or worse, once an hour, day and night, ideally for at least 19 years. And so obviously we don't have a lot of long records of tides going back 200 years or more. Philip, you mentioned some long-term records from Liverpool. I should explain one thing. I will not be telling you why the people at Camelot drink champagne at noon. Chris Hughes will hopefully do that. Where are you, Chris? Will you? Possibly. Will you have time to amend your talk? Because <laughs> they're desperate to know. The observing of tides in the port of Liverpool is, uh, let's just go back one, which might work better. Somebody has been seen observing tides near Liverpool <laughs> and doing it 24 hours a day. Have they been there 19 years? I suppose they have now. Um, it's a pretty hazardous thing to do as... Uh, ah, well, that's jumped a slide. So now I'm going to tell you how we measure tides, but very quickly. Philip showed you one of these. There are quite a few of them around Liverpool docks, aren't there? half tide measures, all in beautiful Roman numerals. We, uh, we now use something a little bit more ecologically desirable uh, and perhaps a bit more legible. Uh, traditionally, sea level measurements over the last 100 years through the 19th, 20th century were always measured using some sort of well over deep water and you'd have a float and pulley system going up and down in the well and ink, pen, chart recorders. 
All of that's gone now, and the very latest way of measuring sea level is to use satellites, the sort of thing that is very similar to an echo sounder at sea, but the timing is something like 1,000 millionth of a second to get the required levels. So what does this guy down at Crosby actually observe? Well, let's show you 14 days of sea levels at Liverpool. And I'm going to point out three characteristics of Liverpool tides. The first thing is that, of course, it goes up and down regularly. And the average time between one high water and the next, and time is going this way, of course, high water, high water, high water, low water, is 12 hours and 25 minutes on average. There is a time of large tides, spring tides, followed by a time of neap tides, then spring tides again. Spring doesn't mean that it happens in March and April. It's to do with springing and liveliness. And neap tides is I don't know what the origin of neap is. The French equivalent is eau more, meaning dead water. But that is a 14.8 day cycle if you look very carefully. And then if you look very, very carefully, you'll see at certain times of the month, the high successive low waters and elsewhere high waters are higher and lower by a foot or so. I'm allowed to speak about feet, aren't I? Just, just historical media. <laughs> Not all tides are like that. So let's, since I'm supposed to be talking about ocean tides, let's just show five places around the world, starting with the one at the top, which is in Australia, Gulf of Carpentera, and that has one tide a day, which falls to zero, then up again and down again. San Francisco in Pacific, North East Pacific, has a mixed tides, which are sometimes once a day and sometimes twice a day. Bermuda and to some extent Bombassa look much more like Liverpool tides, with the twice a day tide dominating, and then sometimes once a day. And here is my favorite place for tides. It's, it's Ireland, it's south of Wexford, thing, Court Town, and that has four tides a day, and that is something we're not going to talk about again today. <laughs> well, this guy and his predecessors out at Crosby said, well, look, um, can we explain all of this tidal phenomena? 20, 12 hours, 25 minutes, um, four spring neap cycles, and they had all sorts of explanations. The, the one that sort of resonated most, I think, was the fact that people worshipped the moon. They worshipped the sun, and they recognized that the sun and moon were linked to those tidal patterns. And they said, but the only evidence of our gods on this earth are the tides. And not having your acumen, instead of worshipping Philip Woodworth, they built temples where the tides would just come and recede. There's some in India, I believe. And then somebody said, no, 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 no. So it's something to do with the earth breathing. We think it's the earth breathing. And then somebody else said, no, 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 no. It's the moon. When the moon's light is shining on the earth, that brings the tides. And there was one, I believe, um, Arabic explanation, which was that there was a huge god somewhere just over the horizon who kept lifting his foot up and down. And when it was in the water, it was high tide. And when they took it out again, it was pretty regular. And then came Newton. Well, as you've already heard this morning, somewhat unfairly, I should say, Newton was a miserable character. I quote. Well, we could do with a few more miserable characters if they were all. Newton, apart from all of his um, laws of motion and really putting at least physics into the modern era, also in his analysis 
developed the law of gravitational attraction, which, does, despite what Philip said, this is another equation. Um, he just said that everybody in the universe, and I don't mean everybody, I mean every body, is attracted to every other one by a force which is proportional to the product of the two masses, m1, m2, and inversely proportional to their separation. And that's very important. That separation, the r squared on the bottom, makes a very big difference. Because, in case I forget to say it later, the sun's tides, tides due to the sun, are 46% on average the value of the tides due to the moon. And that's because the moon is nearer, but it's much less heavy. Um, I just thought, because you'll often see diagrams like this, that showing the moon and earth and sun in line, and when they're in line we get big tides, I thought I'd just have to give you some idea of the actual relative separations and sizes. And I do have here, those of you will have noticed, that's clearly the earth, I blew that up myself this morning, as they say on Blue Peter. It took quite a long time, by the way. Now this I have here is a moon to the same scale. Now I know the moon isn't red. We all know that it hasn't got spikes. And we all know that it's made of green cheese. What I want somebody to do now, if, if I could get somebody to do this, is to take this and guess how far from that Earth, which I'm going to keep at the front because I paid for it, um, could, I, could I have a, a volunteer? Oh, oh well, here we have a volunteer. <coughs> Hard luck on the rest of you. Uh, Stuart, it is your name, isn't it? Yes, I'm, I'm psychic like that. <laughs> I'm your psychic, actually. Yes, but now you're the moon man. Can I ask you to hold that and just stay there for a minute and smile at the audience, turn and face them. <laughs> Would you think that that was about the right spacing on scale? Roger's shaking his head, but then you did spend a lot of time working on this. Could I ask you to go towards the back of the room, slowly, and we'll tell you when to stop. Not now. He's got to go 18 meters, 60 Earth radiuses. You can, well, you'll have to stop now, won't you? There he is. That. OK. Thank you, Stuart. Um, that, no, you can. Yes, right. Now, the big objection to Newton's laws of motion, and particularly his gravitation, the gravitational stuff was, how on earth does that force work through that distance and through the uh, vacuum without any, any piece of string or anything holding it? Can you throw that ball back, please, Stuart? Thank you. Where did I put the thing? <laughs> Here we are, magically. And during that small interval, a thong has been tied to it, which is why we have spikes. And, and the whole point is, of course, that that gravitational force, it's come off. <laughs> How long have you got? not easy doing a reef not at speed. That force actually, oh you didn't say this thing would be tied around her neck either. This really, that gravitational force is what keeps the moon in orbit. I haven't got a long enough string to, and there's that tension in that piece of uh, thong, you okay down there? Yeah. Um, is what keeps it in motion. That balance between the force needed to keep it in an orbit and 
the desire it has to carry on according to Newton's laws of motion again in a straight line. We have to keep changing that momentum. Now here's a slide I really wanted to show you earlier, which was how useless it is putting numbers up to give you relative dimensions. And that was where we should have done the demonstration, Stuart, but it, we've done it now. Um, anybody live in New Brighton? In a large detached house? That would be the equivalent in our terms of the sun in that orbiting system. Or if you don't know the Whittle well, it's the cricket pavilion out at Egberth is the equivalent size and distance. Right, now then we get to the interesting bit. Um, it's okay, a bit of potential theory. Uh, well, not for me. It's years since I understood that sort of thing. What I propose to do is to borrow something from uh, the web, which I think really excellently shows the effects. Because when that moon is in orbit around the Earth, the force pulling it into the orbit is exactly balanced at the center of the moon for that orbit. Which means, in very simple terms, that the water on the side nearest this is the Earth, but I've got to do it with this because that keeps... Um, the, the side nearest the moon, let's do it this way, nearest the moon, the water is actually pulled towards the moon because it's slightly stronger than the balance which is exactly at the center of the Earth in its orbit. And on the far side, you find that the Earth is, as it were, being pulled away from the water. So you get a double bulge, pulled towards the moon, Earth pulled away from the water. And the Earth in its rotations is always rotating in that double bulge. Now this is where we had trouble yesterday, where we couldn't get it to work. But today, it's working. And I think you can see why as the Earth goes through a complete day, the moon is overhead again. That person goes through low tide, high tide, low tide, high tide, and this goes on day after day, year after year. How long have you got? So you get two tides, high tide, low tide a day. But what about the 12 hours and 50 minutes? Well, by the time that guy comes back to the first high tide, the moon has moved on sufficiently far in its own orbit around the Earth that it has to move a little bit further, it takes a little longer to catch up, and that's where the extra 50 minutes comes from. We're now then. We said that the sun has a tidal raising potential of about 46% of the moon. So the moon, in terms of the forcing, dominates, but is modulated throughout the lunar month by the effects of the sun's tide additionally. So we'll look at this. Now the Earth's rotating much quicker because the satellite is taking a month to go around. And if you look at the right-hand side of the moon, that's the side facing the sun, so that's the side we on Earth would see as illuminated. And at that position, the sun and moon's tides are cancelling to the extent that the tides on Earth are about 50% on average. Now here's the full moon when we get spring tides because that side is completely illuminated by the sun. If the Earth gets in the way, we get an eclipse, but that rarely happens. <coughs> spring tides, that's an eclipse because the sun is pulling the other way. Moon gravity, sun gravity, spring tide. Moon minus sun, leap tide. 
In fact, the highest tides in Liverpool are about a day and a half after new moon and full moon. That's due to energy losses and travel times and <coughs> so forth. It's a lot easier watching this than seeing me waving my arms around. <laughs> and finally, the thing that we did touch on very briefly was this once a day tides, and I'll just do that very quickly, which is that the Earth, when the Moon moves up and down north and south of the equator, which it does over a period of 27 and a half days, I think, yeah, um, the Earth continues to rotate in this plane about that axis. So if you're sitting at a point here, you've got a tide which is that high, but as you rotate round to here, you catch a much smaller part of the bulge. So you get tides which are not equal through the day, when, but only when, the moon and indeed the sun also, are furthest north and furthest south. So, that's very simple. We're going to get two tides a day. They're going to occur every 12 hours and 50 minutes. Um, we don't get anything like that. If you think about it with the way the Earth rotates, the tides should come towards us from the east. We'd be rotating into the bulge. In Liverpool, the tides come from the west because they've come from the Atlantic Ocean through the Irish Sea to Liverpool. And they've traveled as, it's that man again, a Kelvin wave. We don't get anything like that because the oceans aren't deep enough for the waves to travel because the continents get in the way of any wave that would want to travel under the moon and sun. Because the Earth's rotating, things get sort of thrown to one side or another um, because they want to go in a straight line, but they can't. The Earth itself does actually have small tides and it flexes very slightly directly to the gravitational forces, but we're talking about a few tens of centimeters but it's certainly measurable, and that's an aspect we haven't said much about the work of Pittston, which was a lot of pioneering work on studying the Earths of the tides of the solid Earth. So what we actually get, and you've seen this before, but I won't explain it either, this is the once-a-day tides, and you can see there's a pattern which suggests that the once-a-day tides are most common here around Indonesia, northern Australia, where I showed you some once-a-day tides, one or two small isolated places where the local, we call them resonances, where say the Irish Sea has a natural period which might get excited. And also I think the once a day tides, this is the only latitude where a tidal wave can travel around the earth without a continent getting in the way. And you can see some sort of slight enhancement there. But the twice a day tides are much more common and the pattern is more intricate, and the places where you get large once-a-day tides are Mozambique Channel, around Indonesia, Alaska, New Zealand, and of course, our particular part of the Northeast Atlantic here. So the Liverpool tides are in fact among the biggest in the world. I'm going to ask you a question. Does anybody know where the world's biggest tides occur? Bay of, Bay of Fundy. Well, just as a compensation, I'll show you this very nice image of tides in the Bay of Fundy. You can see the shadow moving around, and soon some people will come out and do an afternoon shift, clean the boat and go home. Oh, they're gone. You're wrong, of course. <laughs> the world's largest tidal range is not in the Bay of Fundy. And when you go home tonight, or wherever you're going from here, <coughs> you will um, you'll be able to use that interesting information, or not, as the case may be. The world's largest tidal range occurs in a place in northern, that's a bit bright, but never mind, 
northern Canada, Ungava Bay, and it's Leaf Bay, and the maximum range there is 16 meters. The range in Bay of Fundy, particularly Burncoat Head and the Minas Basin down here, is 15.8 meters. Close. <laughs> the Canadian Hydrographic Office looked at this and decided it was a draw. <laughs> um, possibly because not a lot of tourists go up to Ungava Bay. <laughs> That's Ed Hill, they were. That, that's, those are two directors of the National Institute of Oceanography, as was and is and ever shall be. The other thing I wanted to just show you was the question of our tides changing. Well, in the world's oceans, we really have no evidence. Ocean tides are due to the astronomical forcing, and that doesn't change very much, moon and sun orbits, on the oceans, deep ocean basins, which don't change very much. Um, and Philip mentioned David Cartwright, but David Cartwright did look at some data from St. Helena and proved that the range of tide changed less than 2% in over 200 years. Has anybody been back and looked at that? Probably not. Um, I've been looking and continue to look at time of tides around Ireland. Um, some data from 1842, and the tides have changed by five minutes or less, and that's probably within the accuracy of chronometers in 1842. Uh, Liverpool high waters have changed. Philip did some work on the records of Hutchinson. Um, you showed his picture, I think. And the high waters in Liverpool have increased by half a metre from 1768. Um, and that is due to an increase in the mean sea level, rather than the tides. I should acknowledge the motion picture bits, not the Bay of Fundy. They were done for a state school in Queensland, and I nicked them. Thank you ever so much. Um, it was for a primary school, by the way, in case you were feeling rather good about it. <laughs> I, was a, I was amazed at the educational standards in Queensland. Um, so, thank you. Um, that's it. Goodbye from me, and goodbye from them. Thank you.